Valentine's. You're always looking my Valentine's. Yeah. Do you know in France it's no big thing and I'm just coming, I was on the plane and the pilot said, Happy Valentine's Day. Like, this is a true holiday. <laughs> so we have goodies for you. Woo. First we have a conversation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you've been on this press tour for like seven months, man. Yeah. And <laughs> Celine the Machine. You're like, what are you going to do after, after this show? You're going to go to Disney World or something? <laughs> you know, now, now I'm dreaming in English. <laughs> My dreams are in English. So you're just uh, getting, you're doing a movie now? I don't know. Thinking about it? I mean, <laughs> I really enjoyed it, and I'm, I'm mostly also because, you know, it was important for me to have a conversation, mm -hmm. a serious conversation, an emotional conversation around the film, and I've had it, I've had it here, so it's important for me, really. That's what's up. Um, we love the film here. At least I do, as you can tell. Um, I wanted to start asking uh, a little bit about your filmography, because throughout your filmography, I've noticed that some of the names are similar. Uh, Marianne, um, you know, Marie from Water Lilies, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, but Marianne? Yeah. And Girlhood, I'm so sorry, I butchered that. Um, is, there, is that a coincidence or is that? It's definitely a choice um, that all my characters would be, would have kind of the, the same name, but not quite the same, except for Tomboy. Um, main character is named Law, and actually this because I'm nervous to do this, but this is like the end of the tour. It's an emotional Q&A. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it's the name of my brother, but I didn't find him in mm -hmm. female way. Um, and uh, otherwise, yeah, it's always, a, and, and I'm kind of thinking about my next film, and it's kind of a new Marie, Maria, Maria. It's, it's, yeah, I like to think. It's the way also that the film holds hands, you know, it's, the way, it's kind of the way that the film has shared friendship. Speaking of like the way your films hold hands, I noticed like you got, it seems like you have an affinity for the elements. This is sort of really on fire, and then you have water lilies, so you're getting like an earth title, or something <laughs> air in the title, right? Well, you're good, Valerie, because you know, um, when I started thinking about my fourth film, knowing it was kind of a departure from the first one that I consider a trilogy uh, coming of age story, I thought, okay, I want to, I want the rapture, I want something that's different, but also kind of a secret thing for this, because you know, you need fuel to keep you going, um, even if you're trying to, to depart from your comfort zone, and I'm like, what are these elements? Is, what, I was like, what's the trilogy, what is fourth? What would be the fourth thing? I don't know. So I'm like, okay, what are these? Is water. Tomboy is air. It begins with the hands of a child, you know, basically playing with air. Uh, girlhood was brown, earth. Um, and I thought, oh, there's fire. <laughs> I'm going to make a film about fire. So, you got any other concepts going through that? Like well, what's yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Help me out. Um, uh, so, I guess my next question is how did you come up with the idea uh, for this movie, particularly the circumstances of the two protagonists? with Eloise being a nun, or a former nun, and Marianne being a, a painter, an artist. Because um, they could have just been two rich chicks in London. <laughs> but you know, you gave it sort of some depth, and I'm just wondering where that came from. Well, it came from this whole political project also that is actually caring about the characters, even though they're women. Um, and so, you know, because usually we used to women. We just used to woman character. Um, and like because it would be in the past, you would be you would have an even greater alibi because women did very few of the same thing, you know, to actually just consider them as like two girl in Versailles mm -hmm. or two girl in um, and we're not doing that. Um, they are not just girls. They are they are, they have like a background, they have like um, a sociology, um, and they're, they're trying to, even though they're few important opportunities for them, they're trying to be a lot for themselves. Um, so those two characters, yeah, they, all women have, 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 have those kind of stories. It's just that they're not told. Um, and I really wanted to show women artists at work. Um, and also to show uh, that um, even just this aristocratic woman, 
like she's very emblematic of the opportunities that they had at the time. They basically all went to Canton to get an education, and then like, in, in if there were like two sisters, like one of them would get married, and the other one would basically um, well, stay in Canton. Um, so it was a way to be actually to, to, to care and to take seriously those destinies of women um, from from the past that they actually had like context and and even though they had no choice they still had to go through some shit and right. like we better talk about this right and so you have uh, Marianne and Heidi but I want to talk about Sophie for a little bit because Sophie is kind of like the real MVP. Okay, so raise your hand. Raise your hand if you think Sophie knew about what was going on. That's a good survey. And I'm wondering, when you were, you know, when you started writing this project, how did you filter in? How did you figure out how this third person was going to connect with this dynamic between these two women? Because Sophie receives a different type of love um, within the film, and so was was Sophie always a character that you had on your mind, or no? Did you come later? No, she was definitely part of, uh, of, of the whole concept uh, from the origin. And um, because I wanted to talk about friendship also, and, on, and, and friendship also um, between the two lovers, um, and how they would share their friendship with, with another woman. And also about the embody sorority, you know, give it uh, depth, give it, give it like um, an organic thing, like, Give, give some room to this, like share this experience on the screen. Like for instance, like this, this thing where the three women are in the kitchen, uh, which is like this very simple frame, just silence, and they're just going through their activities, even though they are subversive activities, because uh, the authoritative woman is cooking while the maid is doing embroidery. And um, this scene, for instance, was one of the scenes that I, that I was the most excited about and that I had in mind even before I had the whole the whole plot of the film. It was one of the compass of the film. Um, and um, so Sophie's character, basically, I tried to, was, yeah, was at the origin of the thing, and I really tried not to build this character as the servant character, um, with this question, like, does she know? Is she an antagonist? Is she an antagonist? Is she okay with this? Is she listening to them? Or she's not even there as an extra, you know? You never see her with, um, uh, the contents, for instance, but I really know she's not here with it, you know, trying to, I don't know, bringing glass or whatever. She's only in the frame, which is something to say and, and a goal for herself, something to do. And, I, and, and so it, it, that's a real thing to do because you have to resist the fact that you can say, okay, she has disappeared for 20 minutes and suddenly she's here. Um, you, you don't even know if she's, she knows or she knows. And that's what's basically the whole. Uh, project with the writing of this film and also it's about resisting mm -hmm. this classic storytelling. Uh, what do you do with characters like, oh, you know, and being compromising about it because people will tell you, oh, where is she and, and what is she doing and what is she thinking and I don't care. Like, right. you know, <laughs> because, uh, I mean, you would make a less of a character actually if, she, if you would answer those questions uh, in the right timing. Um, you would share less of her experience. And that's what I was trying to do, to put all these subjects on screen so the characters would be there if you share that experience. I remember, I remember this was saying, I remember when, I don't know, I thought maybe this was her, they go, how did she get pregnant? And I'm like, wait, what? <laughs> 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 people get pregnant, why do you get pregnant? <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, I, when you talk about like the three of them in the one frame, um, can you talk a little bit about the blocking and the staging of the film uh, of the characters? Because um, when the three of them together are together, there's so many layers and, and, and levels that are there. Um, was that deliberate? Did you storyboard at all? Like, how did you? Well, I don't know if, if storyboarding is drawing the film. Yeah. I didn't do that. Um, but. For me, the writing is complete when I'm, I have like, it's not about having the mood board of the visuals, I don't have that. It's just like, if there's a strong idea of, I never know that word in English, and it's been a seven month tour, so maybe it doesn't exist. <laughs> Help me out here. <laughs> mise en scène, staging. Yeah. <laughs> a strong idea for that. For instance, you know, I'm trying not to cover myself with the beginning and the endings of the scene, like 
right? So that's when she, when Marianne at the beginning is like discovering a whole room and she sees the painting with her face, then there's a cut when you see like little feet and the, the green dress. This is like written and this is, so if that's storyboarding, mm -hmm. yes I do. Um, but I tend to, there must be those kind of a craving for, for visual or an idea or cut or sound. Uh, so, so that it's not just uh, the idea of the scene or the words, and and we'll see that on set. You know, I'm not chemistry, for instance. When I oh, there's such chemistry. Yeah, that's job. That's a that's hard job. It's their job. It's my job. It's also writing, and it's then melody, rhythm. That's what you create on the set. You don't create chemistry like oh, are they enjoying this? No. I mean, of course we're all enjoying this, but as you were, you know, it's like yeah. It's ideas, we're all sheltered by these ideas that we put together. And then, so there are strong ideas for something that has to do with, uh, you know, with thinking and with them. But then every night before shooting, I reconsider it all. And mostly as the shooting and then as the day go by, like the grammar of the film, the language of the film, rather than the visual, and the, the language of the film, we speak more and more, and so we can be more, more bold and more radical with this idea. So it's not about changing them, it's about being more and more uh, yeah, radical and analogical about them, and taking more and more risks. For instance, um, the scene where Sophie hangs on this, you don't see what it is, but like thing, and then they have a talk about like, have you ever been in love? This actually is a very long scene, and it should be like, edited a lot because you know this idea that somebody would be hanging there and you would just go and look at something else <laughs> is weird that's not, some, that's not something that I, but like this was very late in the shooting and we were already like we had done a lot of things from like day 25 or something like that and I'm like this has to be a long take i think this has to be like a track shot and it's weird um, but it, it should and it's going to be difficult a lot of things involved, um, and that's the kind of radicality that that you you, you that actually go through as as yeah, lo your language is more and more you speak more and more the language of the film, but still during the process of writing you have to be very accurate, very radical, at, at least theoretically about that language, and then be be, be an athlete for that language. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. I, I, I'm speaking of radical. <laughs> I've been saying that word a lot. is not about the visual. I think we're looking at a very narrow way in looking at that. And I think that's, like for instance, in uh, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, when like Brad Pitt takes his shirt off on that roof, I wish that film on the plane. <laughs> I want this to be really clear. Um, <laughs> I haven't ended yet, you know. I'm gonna, I'm gonna watch the last scene of my and I'm going all the way with this. And when Brad Pitt did his shirt up on the roof, everybody's like, oh, that's female gaze. Because female gaze would be objectifying a man. Uh, so we're mistaking like skin, showing skin, showing sex scenes, like with male gaze and female gaze. It's not about that. It's 
self visual is about the power dynamic. So mostly I think it's it has to do with the storytelling. And if if we we and it's this idea that, that it's about yeah, are you gonna show nudity or not? That would be like this would make it all moral. I think it has to do with ethics rather than moral, um, regarding also the power dynamic that you how do you work. Um, but mostly I think the film is of the film has to do with the new power dynamic that is just on screen. So film is has a lot to do with uh, the relationship with Sophie, for instance. Um, and how do you uh, depart from convention because cinema is built around male gaze, it's the art of male gaze, and it's a very democratic one. That's why it's the art of male gaze, or the ultimate, I don't know, both. Um, and so I'm getting lost. I'm getting lost here. <laughs> <laughs> so it's mostly about the construct, the, the construct in that. Um, and, and so it is the body from convention. Basically, that is convention, because it's a convention to look at women's ass and women's body and not consider them as character. That's a lot of what we've seen, and sometimes it's really exciting, you know. Um, so it means, it means like, we, I think we all know how to write conflict. We all know, and we feel like we're writing when we're doing this, and that's the danger. It's like, I feel like I'm doing cinema when I'm writing a scene when there's a conflict and a strong bargain. And so it means you have to resist that and to, to, to believe and kind of being kind of lonely with it that you can make tension out of something else. And that's the hardest part, I think. So I think the female gaze should really start, you know, it's like, it, it starts with you being alone in your room in what you're writing. Um, is that an answer? That's an answer. Yeah, that's an answer. <laughs> um, we got time for like two questions, maybe. Um, and then I have a few of us. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so I guess, um, so I know this film stars and has a crew of pretty much exclusively women, um, which is really unusual, unfortunately. What were some of the greatest joys of working with that dynamic during the process and then kind of everything after that as well? What, sorry, I didn't get the, 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 the tension in the question. Um, so because you worked mostly exclusively with women yeah. on this film cast and crew, yeah. what are some of the greatest joys of that dynamic? Oh. <gasps> <laughs> All of them. <laughs> um, you know what, I think I'm privileged enough to choose who I work with, um, and also basically that's how I live my life. So, and you know when they talk about utopia, and sometimes I mean, it's like, oh, this island, like would be like Wonder Woman Island, it's a utopia, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but the utopias, our utopias, they're not ideas. Like, I live this utopia. I mostly live among women. Um, and it's possible. Like, the dystopia, they exist too, you know? Uh, like, there, there are places where, like, it's very easy. Like there are places where those, the, like, I don't know, like um, there are villages where the ec ecology is central, you know, it, it, it does exist. You know, the, you, our utopias, they are based on our experience. Um, they're not like imaginary world. So I don't know about how do people do. <laughs> and I hope they're living their utopia, even if they're male driven, you know. They're surely, surely must be the case. Um, it's just not, I mean, politics are just not ideas. It's also, it's places, it's feelings, it's it's friendship, it's love, it's sex, it's whatever, it's, it's and, and, and sometimes you're lucky enough, also aging, lucky enough to actually like choose to live in those places and to be free. Um, and that's a, I don't even know what that could be. <laughs> Who was it? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, hi, uh, my name is Megan. Uh, I just wanted to start by saying that this is a film that's really 
like holds a special place in my heart. Like this is my third time being at Angelica and like my second time with my girlfriend. Woo! Yeah, what you like? Thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask because one of my favorite things about your films, like this and Girlhood, is your writing. Like you write dialogue so naturally. Like you convey like in Girlhood, you know, youth and like wanting independence so uh, so raw and naturally and here you convey you know the timidness and like the loss of like you feel in love and like the struggles with that and I want to ask as you know like a woman and like a member of the LGBT community like an aspiring filmmaker like what's your process when you're writing and like your process with directing and like what advice you would have for that? That's not <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm gonna I'm gonna try to answer to you going through this idea of the dialogues. Um, I think uh, I try to to create a dynamic where um, once more not relying on conflict. For instance, like there's no even when you have an argument. Uh, they're both being clever, and I'm trying to just to have people talk like they were they were really good conversation, and not trying to win some kind of battle. So I always come back to this this dynamic of conflict through dialogue, like a good scene would be a good bargain between two people. If you really try to, uh, I try to make them honest and to say what they feel and think, and be very smart people also thinking. Because you're not, not crafting a world for yourself, you know, uh, I'm crafting a world for you. So also, and that would be my advice maybe, uh, thinking that like you're all the most intelligent people. Like I'm always trying to, I think, I really think that, otherwise I won't do film. And I, and it's, it's, but it's kind of a subversive subsurf, idea because we keep being told like, oh, the audience has to understand, you know, has to enjoy, you have to have this kind of emotional ride. And I feel and like cinema has to be like entertaining because people they have to escape from their lives. And I find that a like terrible idea because I think people who go to cinema, they have ambition for their lives. They're not trying to escape shitty lives or whatever. They're taking the risk to fall in love with people who don't exist. To I mean to like to speak a language they don't know. And it, like it's especially for a foreign language film, but also just the language of the film. It's not about the language they speak, I'm going Bong Joon Ho all the way. <laughs> <laughs> That's my man. Um, leading the way. Um, no, but I mean, it's like taking a risk of, of oh, you know, I'm taking a risk. I'm being kind of naked when I'm doing this, but you're also taking a risk of getting in a room. And you're paying for this. I hate this idea that cinema should be something that would escape, that, that would make you escape from what kind, what kind of reality. I think it puts you in a position where you're ambitious for yourself. Yeah. And ambition also as a collective because we're all in this together here. And my advice would be to think like as a like build your your film as a language you would want a, a group of people to speak and to understand and and believe that their brains that the that cinema is ideas. Believe that this the pleasure is gonna be that it's gonna be like sh sharing this language, this intelligence, you know, and, and relying on that. So that would be my advice, because I think it's an advice we've never given. So I always just, you know, yeah. All right. My answers are very long, I'm sorry. <laughs> Which is the best advice that you can give for a young filmmaker? I just did. <laughs> 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 I 
Also, I'm very bad at giving advice in this country because it's like I come from a very privileged industry that doesn't work at all. Like here, also we have like public support. <laughs> I mean, a lot of money. Like we're making fifty for every year. We have twenty-five percent women director, which is low. Let's not be. Let's not clap about this. And if you're steady for thirty years, and I'm glad you're not clapping. <laughs> you're right. I'm like art. Um, so, um, can, yeah, no, I'm not going to repeat myself, but I can look if you're something that's being apologetic, <laughs> being radical, because being radical is being generous. Yeah, you were there at the beginning, and I thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>